Welcome to the Do It All Dad, your podcast, dad-friendly entertainment for you and me. I'm your host, Michael Kornbluth, and this is episode 63, If My Son Played With Dolls. Kevin Hart said he'd uh, break his dollhouse over his son's head. Not Kevin Hart's dollhouse, his son's dollhouse. Kevin Hart said, this was about 15 years ago, he said that he would break his son's dollhouse over his son's head if he caught him playing with dolls. Sound more like a stereotypical black comedian trying to downplay your ties to the hip-hop gay mafia. Can I get another holla for some holla? For the record, Alan and World at Large, there's no such thing as Kevin Hart haters. Just like there's no such thing as any Kevin Hart lovers. Comedy Central felt the same way when they re-signed Trevor Noah for the foreseeable future. I gotta interject just one more. Can I get a holla for some holla? For the record, there's no, just to be abundantly clear, there's no such thing as Kevin Hart haters. Just bemused, short on laugh spectators. It's bad enough that LeBron James, the king of the persecution complex, has to enshroud his entire fake news on the greatest legacy and anyone that questions otherwise is being a so-called hater. Like, to make matters worse, now we have, like, Alan, like, pushing Kevin Hart, who did apologize for his comment many numerous times. Regardless of motives, Kevin Hart's on Alan. And Alan's like, come on, just say you're sorry. But Alan, my problem is Alan pushing for more so-so funny and enabling so-so funny comedians to do the same is uh, more forced mediocrity and... More force, idealist mediocrity, and I think America as a whole uh, is has no interest. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we've already moved forward. But and just to be clear, I there is no such thing as a Kevin Hart hater. For example, I love that Kevin Hart named his son Hendrix. <laughs> I hear my train come in. I used to walk with my daughter in Pleasantville, and I would sing that song by Jimi Hendrix. Hear my train come in. Blue song on. Uh, Jimi Hendrix Blues, You're Welcome Again. And I used to sing this this verse where I'd say, Pretty soon I'm going to buy this town. Pretty soon I'm going to buy this town. And I'm going to put it all in my shoes. That's what I'm going to do. And then my dad would say, Daddy, you must need a really big shoe for that. <laughs> uh, which always cracked me up. Uh, another true story, while I'm taking a shoulder memory lane over here, when my daughter was only three, proof of her comedic genius emerging, she stepped on her uh, Disney pink ukulele guitar, uh, and she never did anything like that. I said, Matilda, you never step on a guitar. And then without missing a beat, my daughter says, but Jimmy played with his teeth. <laughs> Can I get another holla for some holla? I had to stop smoking weed altogether because of my daughter, because she would ask these like super intense you know, questions that my uh, retarded brain were never able to keep up with. <laughs> For example, she'd say, so daddy, if God created the universe, then who created God? And I'd say, God went back in a time machine made by Elon Musk. And then my daughter would say, real convincing, dad. Thanks for making me an atheist at four. Again, just to be clear, listeners, there's no such thing as Kevin Hart haters. Just like there aren't any real LeBron James Haters, just other side resistors who don't think they've clinched chosen one status just yet. I don't care how many followers they have on Twitter. I wonder yeah, the the morality police. The uh, I wonder what you know who uh, I mean. Sarah Silverman has like twenty million uh, followers. Last time I checked, which is like beyond ridiculous. So and I love it how she questions the uh, the maturity of the president of the United States. Uh, because she would totally, cause th- and this is coming from a woman who still takes bong hits in her hoodie into her late 40s, <laughs> who never outgrew her truly alternative, uh, tasteless jokes phase. <laughs> but enough of wasting my breath on Yenta Breath, who used to be funny until she got hysterical like the rest. So I wonder if what Ellen's thoughts are on reinstating uh, designated hitter Albert Bell into the Baseball Hall of Fame consideration conversation. <laughs> I've always said that, I've always thought that uh, steroids should not 
known steroid use, admitted steroid use, proven steroid use, speculated steroid use. I don't care. I don't think that that should be a eliminator for consideration to Baseball Hall of Fame because there's no substitute for clutchness. And if I just took if I took steroids at Slipway Camp, I just would have struck out at a more accelerated speed. Can I get another holla for some holla? If my son played with dolls, I tell him to wrap seaweed around pack of wood before making his move again on Polynesian Barbie. Ha! Nah. The beauty of that joke, people, is that Pekka Wood is, in fact, a nickname that I came up, came up with one night in honor of my four-year-old son uh, developing uh, schlongage uh, appendage, if you will. Yeah, and he's blonde hair, blue eyes, looks like a dreamy cross between Leonardo DiCaprio and Chad Allen from Our House and uh, River Phoenix, so it just works on every level. It's just beautiful. So uh, I really hope the Podesta brothers aren't listening. The... Um, because they definitely commissioned our piece as we speak. If my son play with dolls, I think I'm getting the Kelly LeBrock one using weird science on eBay for my own personal stash to uh, mess around with again and again. If my son play with dolls, I think it's a good thing I am not a black comedian trying to downplay my ties to the hip-hop gay mafia. It's a callback, it's a repeat, but it's my show, so uh, deal with it. If my son play with dolls, We'd skip watching Porky's, which was an overrated comedy anyway. Then I'd push 9 to 5 in front of our viewing list, thinking my son could do worse than becoming a Dolly Parton impersonator, Winnie Houston, not so much. Joe lives! If my son played with dolls, I'd think, great, it'll save me a fortune on sports camp. Plus, I'll have extra time to write more best-selling books, because school plays are an annual production. And most school plays were, were dramatic, or based on a James Baldwin novel, someone kills himself. Whoop de doo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's the like, it's like the true definition of uh, anticlimactic. So uh, not interested. Uh, if my son played with dolls, I think I'd, if I'm gonna watch drama, I want to watch the episode where like Stewie talks uh, Brian out of like blowing his brains out when they're stuck in that uh, safe in a, in a bank. <laughs> that was dramatic yet funny. That's my sort of entertainment. Uh, if my son play with dolls, I think, great. Now, when my dad asked, what's Arthur going to eat at the Greek diner with his friends after the ball game? I'd say, a turkey melt, assuming he's got some extra wiggle room to slip into his leotards. If my son play with dolls, I'd have him own it and dress up as the flaming human torch for Halloween. Then again, Mr. Fantastic has a gay, fabulous connotation to his name also. But his hot wife, Susan Storm, is no Liza Minnelli. If my son played with dolls, I'd think, touchdown! Now I don't have to talk shop at Pop Warner with other football dads from New England. I still think Eli is a bigger pimp than Tom Brady. Giselle's like 80 in model years. Nah! If my son... Poor Giselle. I, I love it when I do that joke and people, they tense up on me. Either they laugh or, or they tense. And I'm saying, are you... For the people that tense, are you kidding me? She popped out of her mom's heavenly snatch, morphing into what's now known as Giselle, ended up on Tom Brady Schlong in the end, lived happily ever after. The end! So it might some play with dolls. I think banging my G.I. Joe figures together was way gayer, especially when I had Gong Ho, manhandle and bitch slap Cobra Commander around like he was his gimpy bitch in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Love that joke. If my son played with dolls, I'd think, what a relief. For a moment, I thought he'd be destined for molt malign misery and turn into another ordinary slut and a straight jacket dad like the rest of us. Take that, Ray Liotta and Goodfellas. I'm just an average schnook. I'm an average schnook. If my son played with dolls, I'd think, big deal. Playing with a sex doll after he blooms under his foot of the looms is way more depraved pathetic. Let's not make my son into a Japanese anime enthusiast just yet. If my son played with dolls, I'd think, cool, he'll be super organized. I'll never have to sweat him dipping into my Adderall prescription. Wait a minute, shit. I have to have the crystal meth talk with him at four. <laughs> if my son played with dolls, I'd move my family to my wife's native homeland of Australia. And so I'd get in my son to compete in an Ironman competition sooner than later so he could become the Aussie superior to Bruce Jenner. My wife is from Australia. She originally was born in Brisbane. Parents moved to Victoria soon after. We wanted to get married there. My mom shot it down immediately. She calls me on the phone. She says, son, I'll show you a very long flight from New York, and your father doesn't love you that much. 
So the compromise I made my wife was, I said, babe, listen, assuming we have a boy one day, instead of hiring a rabbi for the kid's circumcision, we'll hire Crocodile Dundee. Just so we can hear a room full of Jews say, now that's a knife. You could chop it all off with that thing. It's a beautiful thing in this world when you can break in, not break in, when you can welcome the birth of your two sons into this world with that exact joke and get laughs from the uh, hot, pretty, sophisticated Irish delivery doctor in the process, who is usually a very tough laugh. The uh, And I'll leave it at that. My son play with doll. I think, cool. I think I join. This is what I would do. I'll be honest. If my son played with dolls, I join him for some double team action. If he was playing around with his sister's WWE divas, Ronda Rousey, I can live without later in life. I don't see my son choking one out on her behalf. The end. Hope you guys enjoyed that piece, uh, Disorder in the Dollhouse. Um, originally, it was published on the Good Men Project. I found that on Christmas Eve after my brother-in-law was accusing me of being uh, uh, less Jewish uh, than my uh, Gentile wife. <laughs> uh, they all went to church. And uh, I went to uh, process my feelings on Twitter <laughs> and and write some jokes about it. You can check that out on the uh, WordPress blog, Defending My Jewishness on Christmas. It makes a primo chapter in State Owned Comedian to be released uh, by Father's Day 2019. My three kids got my act together. And I don't want to blow my entire load just yet. Uh, but so I learned that they'd uh, taken it down. It was scrubbed. So I'm assuming I pissed off somebody, but uh, I just wanted to throw it out there and and just say, listen, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that piece is very pro. I'm not going to say it's me wishing to find out that my son's going to play with dolls. It's more of a lighthearted comedic treatment, giving perspective to the other side as far as the upside and advantages from a very selfish personal perspective uh, uh, from the dad's perspective. Uh, and I thought that that topic was definitely right for a comedic disruption. So hope you enjoyed that as much as I did performing it. And the Good Men Project has been very good to me. And uh, we were able to reach a, uh, a heightened understanding as to you know what uh, they're all about. And you know I understand that you know we live in very sensitive times and some people could be offended by the use of the word gay and homo. Uh, so uh, not a big deal. Uh, I didn't write that piece in the first place to get published a government project. I wrote it to include in my book. And obviously they thought enough of it to publish in the first place. And, you know, chances are I'm not blaming the government project. I'm blaming some hypersensitive Twitter tot that ruined all the fun for everyone else, but not a big deal. Uh, I have other pieces on the internet forever and uh, you're, you're miserable and you obviously missed the point of the joke. And uh, I would hate being you because you're an edgeless bore. And... Uh, no one likes your company. No one ever seeks it. No one ever fantasizes about it. And you know it. And that's why you're such a miserable Twitter twat in the first place. But I'm over it. I really am. <laughs> I really, really am. So, again, uh, thank you, Good Men Project. Uh, I just learned for embracing the totality of me. And, uh, and for extending my reach. And for... Uh, giving me uh, some nice uh, momentous pop um, heading up to this Father's Day. Just learned actually this morning they're going to be republishing another piece of mine called Defending My Family with an Unused Headbutt. I have a talent for headline hookers. I know. So I also wanted to uh, share with you today uh, another piece called Befriending a Black Editor My Size. <laughs> I need a black editor. Who doesn't mind a good Bruce Jenner joke? Also loves Kanye's Emancipated Mind from MSNBC. Will the dreamy love child of RuPaul and James Baldwin please stand up? Please stand up. Eminem. This is my personation of Eminem. This is my personation of merger talk. This is my personation of business merger talk between Eminem and Dr. Dre. Hey, Slim. Hey, Slim. Microsoft just paid $5.7 billion for LinkedIn. What? LinkedIn is lamer than ever, yo. Can I get another holo for some holo?
Eminem. Mr. Enlightened. He thinks Trump's a Nazi. History lesson. Albino Blondie. When Trump bought mar a Largo, he removed the lifetime ban on Jewish membership. Some fact shady. Just so we're clear. Last time I checked, also, his campaign slogan was make Nazi Germany great again, dude. But I, I enjoyed your... Uh, your, you know, death fantasies of your ex-wife uh, while lasted. Yeah, while well, thinking it was tongue-in-cheek. Obviously, you're uh, not so tongue-in-cheek after all. But, I mean, I mean, you were very funny in Funny People. When uh, you... And that's that, but, you know, that's uh, obviously, uh, you know, funny doesn't really make up for your other shortcomings and, you know, hysterical Nazi blabbering, but, you know, hey, you're obviously not the only one downplaying your ties to the gay hip-hop mafia, but that's okay. They have, I understand it's bad for business, but, uh, so, but seriously, why limit myself to only black editors my size? And, and you were great at Yankee Stadium. I, I did see Eminem at the new Yankee Stadium with Jay-Z, uh, and Eminem was great. He was sober. He was unbelievable. So actually, uh, last weekend I was heading to, uh, Arthur Avenue and we're passing by the new Yankee Stadium on the Deegan and I pointed out, I'm like, look, Matilda, the new Yankee Stadium. The house the gentrification built. She says, Daddy, what's gentrification? I said, liberal talk for less colored. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, less brown people. My daughter is very color specific. The, uh, so, but seriously, why limit myself to only black editors my size when butch, black, lesbo editors can work for me also? Because neither one will be threatened or bothered by my imposing 6-4 frame or be a fan of Joy Reid on MSNBC. So we'll be, kumbaya, <laughs> Joy Reid, in case you're living on a rock, uh, she, she claims like hackers are responsible for posting all this, you know, uh, you know, gays are evil, they belong in hell rhetoric. So, um, you know, she can go after herself. She's fake news, uh, not a fake news liar. She's a certified liar. The, um, do I befriend a black editor my size or a black butch lesbo one? I get to Nick Games, my black editor. Uh, New York Liberty tickets I couldn't give away for free to my daughter with Uber Fair and Magnolia. Cupcake money. <laughs> Growing up, my dad says, Son, you need taller friends. Deep down, he knew I'd outgrow my New York Jewish Japanese American ones once they became petty peons after I exerted my manhood as a co calling IT headhunter for hire and as a open micer on the stand up comedy stage at large. <laughs> I become a republished blogger on the Goodman Project <laughs> the, um, and a hair metal. Uh, Video intro writer historian <laughs> for VH1 and VH1 Classic. Um, I need taller friends, Dad. Well, then sending me to sleepaway camp in Connecticut versus a year wasn't in my best interest. <laughs> Matumbo would scold you right now for walking to that s smack back big guy. Yeah, definitely doesn't do wonders for the self esteem when, uh, I mean, you know, it's not my dad's fault, but doesn't do any wonders for the self esteem uh, as a kid when you're sent to sleepaway camp only to find out that you're the uh, second. Uh, worst athlete after the uh, chic son from Great Neck. <laughs> so that joke is more pretentious than you need to know. You know, thus far, uh, I do have an impressive track record of impressing uh, black comedic luminaries with my emotive super type praise on Twitter. This A-list group includes the late great Dick Gregory, the precursor to Paul Mooney, who made it okay for Paul Mooney to sit his black ass down for an entire, like, one hour sets, <laughs> doing politically pointed jokes, taking a sweet as time in the process. Dick Gregory was the first black comic to headline the Playboy Club, rocking the cool cigarette look before Red Fox coked up the image a bit for even greater clannish hilarious impact. According to Tommy Chong, actually, Red Fox is the only comic he knew who could do one hour of political and one hour of sexual material in a row, as easy as Carlos Mencia stealing it in paid succession. <laughs> the, uh, I also scored a like from Charlie Murphy. Uh, the late great Charlie Murphy, rest in peace, big man. The uh, before he died, a dream maker on his own, becoming a star headliner comedian post Chappelle show against the dying of, of the light, without having to rely on Mr. T voices and deflective homophobic material, <laughs> giving Kevin Hart a good run for his money. <laughs> the uh, that was an obvious uh, dig against uh, Eddie. Your material uh, sounds more dated than Yiddish, Eddie. Of course, you're great, Eddie, but can you drop more f bombs, Eddie, in your films? I can't expose you to my kids, but coming to America is still great. And Arsenio is still awesome. And Arsenio, who I do mention in my book, Stand Up Comedian, is a great role model. Decided to be a stay-at-home dad. Uh, and really, for an extended period of time, uh, after 
at the pinnacle of his success of coming to America and his show, where he interviewed Dyson, Clinton, and all that stuff. So uh, he's a real good guy, and Arsenio's so really funny, and he's got lots of charisma. Always loved Arsenio. Long love Arsenio Hall. And was in any party, too, back in the day, which is really cool. Uh, he, he was like the, the anti-Paul Mooney. He was like the good-looking brother that uh, basically enjoyed all the French benefits of like riding with Eddie. Just like Paul Mooney enjoyed the French benefits of riding with Richard, except instead of doing all the high-grade blow, he would uh, take the $100 bills rolled up for it. <laughs> so, it's, it's a funny contrast. And, and, I, and I, I do have a, a great Paul Mooney story. Uh, I, I hate to sound repetitive, but I just have to bring it up in this instance. The, so I get a callback for a uh, sketch comedy show. Like, a, I don't know, a black SNL, if you will, New Age of Living Color. The, uh, and I saw an ad on it. I was selling, like, news monitoring services, like PR heads. I was in Manhattan. I was in Queens at the time. I was not doing anything for auditions. This wasn't like when I was in LA when I had a commercial agent. And I had, like, a bartending job so I could keep my days open, you know, past that point in my life. And so I go there. I get a call back. I haven't got any callbacks. And I approach Paul Mooney. He wants nothing to do with me. Yeah, I look like Hugh Grant on over here. So I approach him. He's like, yeah, you can sit over there. Scarsdale scumbag. You're the enemy. I hate you. Um, have you ever listened to any of my albums? <laughs> and I said, well, Mr. Mooney, I just read your book. Oh, you read my book. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. A little part you talked about, you know, Richard, your dear friend, blah, blah. And then, uh, long story short, and then also uh, in between my, my semi blogging I went to shake his hand. He's like, no, I'm not going to shake that hand because that's the hand you grip your dick with. And then at the very end, I give myself, I, I say my piece. I, I go back down to my designated cattle call area. Paul Mooney passes by me. Chest thrusted out, looks at me, points in my direction, and says, "I hear you're funny." <laughs> so uh, that's my story, and uh, that felt really good because he did not have to say that. And I'm assuming his only basis of that was based on like my first audition tryout. I have no recollection what I said at all whatsoever, but uh, I love that story, and I'm sure you guys did too. So. And, you know, Charlie Murphy, you know, used to be just a bouncer for for Eddie. And, you know, they talk about that on Chappelle's show. And a lot, what a lot of people don't know about is that, you know, he was also a screenwriter. He wrote Vampire Brooklyn. And so, like, the tweet that I sent him was talking about, like, you know, what a great arc, you know, he's had. You know, where he was essentially, you know, his baby brother's, uh, you know, protector and bodyguard. And then from there, he became a Hollywood scribe. And then... After that, he became a headlining stand-up comedian, you know, all by himself. So, you know, long live Charlie Murphy. I uh, definitely left us too soon. I never saw him perform. Uh, would have loved to, though. Uh, he was always hailed for just being a, a natural uh, storyteller, which is why he was, you know, so popular on the uh, Chappelle show. So, and then also, uh, which is, this is really cool. I mean, this is one of the highlights of my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was able to, I sent, I found out there was like Robert Townsend's birthday, you know, uh, Writer, director, star of the Hollywood Shuffle. He's become like a family friendly like director. And I mean, the Hollywood Shuffle was the best. That and I'll get you sucker. It didn't get any funnier. Those guys were the best. Uh, I was spoiled riding growing up in the 90s as far as exposure to comedy, that, and Dice, and Ronnie. It was just a, it was, it was a, a real high time for uh, comedy. It's aged extremely well. And, but the, the Hollywood Shuffle was great. So I don't remember the, the, the line that I sent to, to Robert Townsend, but he liked it. And uh, that felt really good, <laughs> I have to admit. Yeah, Robert Townsend was like like the black Gary Shanley, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, and uh, you can get it on Amazon Prime, uh, last time I checked, because that's how I'd run it. I hadn't seen it in ages. So, and uh, it's, you know, it's pr pretty pertinent. Uh, timeless film. Unbelievable. So I also, when I was in LA, uh, I got a picture once with Ziggy Marley in Oakwood Apartments <laughs> my last semester at Ithaca College, um, otherwise known as Cornell's retarded next door neighbor. Yet yeah, I could take a bong hit and not stutter every other two seconds. <laughs> yeah. So uh, back in the day, obviously I could do that now, but as you've listened to the podcast, I had my weed exit interview some time ago and uh, that is not in our life for the uh, foreseeable future. <laughs> yeah, we become a functional when we become a best-selling writer, and you know, uh, I eventually go to Amsterdam again in 15 years, we could consider it. So, but so yes, yeah, so Ziggy Marley. I've always loved Ziggy Marley. Ziggy Marley sounds a lot like Bob for the record. If you have an opportunity to see Ziggy Marley, you should definitely see it. He plays Positive Vibration. I saw him in Central Park once. I'm at the Roseland before they close it down. 
Metallica used to play at the Roseland back in the day. Lady Gaga actually did one of the last shows there because it's so cool, Lady Gaga. She went from like open mic coffee shop to like stadiums. And Roseland's more of like that middle ground. So I thought that's so cool that she like closed out uh, like the last show there. I saw Bjork there actually with my wife. Couldn't score weed if my life depended on <laughs> I literally had 5,000 people that showed for weed. Did, didn't materialize in my favor, but didn't matter. Uh, Bjork was really impressive. And then my wife puked in her purse later that night. So just goes to show you sometimes a little weed uh, is a little better than just drinking the booze. Yeah. So uh, that's very comical. But uh, Bjork was great. And her complexion was fantastic in person. The, um, she, she, she looked pretty bangable. I, I got to admit. So the uh, the, the, the whaley uh, club beat and seal shrieks weren't really so prominent. Um, she was just like this like beautiful, awesome, uh, mesmerizing artist. So I could see why people didn't want to get stoned because her uh, heavenly voice was enough. And I will stop licking the uh, Bjork aura clean before I turn off all my listeners forever. <laughs> Not that I care if you listen to Bjork or if your wife does. Yeah, not really the sort of guy. So that really is banking on uh, uh, real alpha males that hate Bjork to listen to my podcast. <laughs> That's not me. Not Michael Savage trying to hide anything. So uh, I was talking about Ithaca and I was talking about Ziggy Marley. Oh, this is my impersonation of uh, Ziggy Marley being interviewed by a reporter from High Times Magazine. For like a Bob Marley retrospective issue, uh, he says, "So Ziggy, like your dad had like thirteen kids. Now, like growing up, you know, we we're taught by our teachers, uh, crazy bald heads, as Bob would call, that we were taught that excessive ganja use drains our ball sack dry and drains all form of life shooting power from our uh, gonads altogether." <laughs> and then Ziggy Marley replies, "Fake news, man. <laughs> Can I get another holla for some holla?" So, uh, recently, uh, Obama uh, said to some reporter, recently, how he loves to uh, no longer be president, uh, and, how, and now he can clam bake in Malaya's dorm room at Harvard and act like a fake news deep biracial Marley. Can I get another holla for some holla blowing through the air? This is my impersonation of Obama this past Thanksgiving. Malaya, you barely touch your tofurkey. It's been months since they pumped your stomach a lollapalooza. How many times do I have to tell you? Adderall, malt liquor, and Martha Stewart's almond weed brownies don't mix. Malaya replies, Daddy, I lost my appetite because everyone at Harvard wants to know why you let me intern for Harvey. Here comes Weinstein. Obama replies in his typical flippant ticket show pill fashion. But Malaya, Michelle was your chaperone on the set of girls, and that fat Jew couldn't pin down Michelle if he tried. <laughs> So like I said, folks, either I befriend a black editor who appreciates the ballsy hilarity of my Obama kill blast or be left with no choice but to kill it as an executive recruiter for the XFL in Stanford, Connecticut in 2019. For once, uh, calling Kaepernick a fake news fro on social media or on my blog or on my book won't make me a victim of white reverse racism. Racism. I can't even say it. For once. For once. What, do I not believe in my convictions? For once, calling Kaepernick fake news fro on social media won't make me a victim of white reverse racism. I can't even say it. For once, calling Kaepernick. How can I be a racist? I can't even say the word. For once, calling Kaepernick fake news fro on social media won't make me a victim of white reverse racism. 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 I can't even say it. For once, Colin Kaepernick, fake news fro on social media, will make me a victim of white reverse racism. Racism. Oh no, he did it. Yes, I did. The end. I still can't say it. It's like God speaking to me right now. I can't say racism. Racism? Oh my God. I got a speech impediment. I can't say racism. I'm stuttering. My stutter is back. I'm being cursed. I can't, I can't say, okay, I can say racist. Let's try this again. Racism. There we go. I got too excited for my own good. <laughs> so uh, this is Doodle Dad, your podcast. Dad-friendly entertainment for you and me. 62 episodes in, I was bound to become a stuttering jerk-off. I uh, hope you guys are embracing my uh, surge of invulnerability. Invulnerability. I can't even talk anymore. I tried to quit when I was ahead.
Unbelievable. But uh, love your sustained interest in the show. Uh, plan on pumping out episodes on a daily basis uh, till I go to uh, Arizona, uh, which is going to be the second week of February. And I'm the game plan is to get on uh, new and notable by pumping out these podcasts um, every day. And obviously, I've got a tremendous backlog of uh, material, similar to Ronnie, when he say uses stuff as jokes in entire duffel bags. And that's how much material he accumulated during his aluminum siding years. So I'm doing something similar uh, on the uh, stay-at-home dad comedian home front. So I will keep the jokes coming at a fast and furious rate. And again, something to look forward to next week, actually, is my conversation. I'm going to be a spiritual medium, and I'm going to be having a conversation with the uh, dead comedy con spirit of Ronnie Dangerfield. Because I definitely know he's uh, had some important messages uh, to communicate and on the uh, spiritual medium uh, destined to reveal uh, that material that uh, we've been long deprived for, for, for too long, Ronnie. So uh, my children love you. And, uh, and for the record, folks, here, I actually cold called Ronnie Dangerfield's daughter to start off this podcast saying that I wanted to interview her because Ronnie was the original do it all dead because Ronnie bought Dangerfields so he could have his own workout stage for his material he had rejected a deal where he would have a residency in Las Vegas George Lopez said most comedians would never do that in a million years so you know Ronnie he made it very clear he suffered from depression his entire life, and his father just took him for granted. He didn't do anything with him, and that's why he so that's why he sought love from strangers for a living. And you know, Rodney, I just love that story of opening Dangerfields so he could be closer to his daughter, and and Dangerfields, you know, still exists. Doesn't really have the uh, the reputation it did, but you know, he was a real father figure to a lot of comedians. Uh, the comedians that were allowed at his deathbed include Dice, Robert Schimmel, Adam Sandler, and uh, those are the ones that come to mind. But, you know, they're all great. So thank you, Ronnie, for giving me inspiration to keep on serving Lady Laugh. And I know uh, you shine on me so far. I will, one of the highlights of my life also was one time me doing some jokes on my wife and my wife saying, you remind me a lot of Ronnie today. <laughs> so uh, I'll keep that going. So it's the Dual Dead Your Podcast, Dead Friendly Entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids through comedy can make our kids great again. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and I'll talk to you guys soon.